Jeff, we're here at this FQXI conference on physics of the observer, physics of what happens, 125 uh, physicists, cosmologists, and very few people who deal with experiments. You're one of the few who, who as a theoretical physicist, are very much focused on experiments. So I'd like you to give me some examples of, of why experiments are so important uh, to understand quantum mechanics. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's actually probably at the very underpinnings of uh, the story of our success. I mean, uh, that we work so closely with, with experimentalists. Uh, there's a great saying from my, uh, my, my grandfather, uh, intellectual grandfather, David Bohm. And he would say that uh, whenever you found some extra baggage in your theory, Right, that didn't have an experimental implication or some experimental consequence, something you couldn't measure and prove, then right there in your face, you're looking at a scientific revolution. If you just got rid of that one extra baggage, then you create a scientific revolution. So our basic philosophy is every single piece of the theory needs to be tested, at least in principle, at least in thought experiment, mm -hmm. not in real experiment. And if we find some extra baggage, we're, 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 we're hunting down a major scientific revolution. So we. Uh, when we come up with a new theory, some new effect, some new phenomena, we're almost right away interacting with the experimental physicists saying, hey, let's try to figure out how you can actually test this thing. Um, what are some examples? Example, um, okay, a uh, favorite example of mine um, is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, quantum Cheshire Cat experiment. So this goes back actually to my, my PhD thesis. I was trying to make the point that, that if you simply think about the basic thing you can do in science as a three-step process instead of a two-step. Usually in science we say you prepare something and you measure it. That's it. Here we're saying you prepare something, you measure it, and then you post-prepare it. You do something later in time. And that, that three-step should be the basic thing. And I was trying to make the point that this is really something profoundly different. And so quantum miracles are all the things that seem to be impossible from just a two-step mm -hmm. process. And so one example is the quantum Cheshire cat. This is sort of like comes from the Alice in Wonderland story. The idea is, can you take a particle and separate from the particle all of its properties? So you have two boxes, one particle. In this box is the particle, and over here are all the properties of the particle, like its magnetic that field. That sounds philosophically absurd. It sounds completely impossible, right? That's just against the basic rules of physics. Turns out you can do this no problem if you allow for the relevance of the future to the present. And you know, the theory was very clear what the predictions would be, and so we worked with um, some uh, experimentalists who do work on neutrons, and, and they happen to have a great big nuclear reactor in the backyard, and they were able to separate the neutron from its, uh, from its magnetic field. And this is a, you know. And, and so what, what does that mean when the neutron in, in, in one place had no magnetic field and the magnetic field was in the other place by itself without a particle? Without a neutron, that's right. So we, we have say one neutron, you look over here, you see the neutron, no magnetic field. You look over here, no neutron, but the magnetic field is over there. So what's the implication of that? The, the implication is that um, this three-step process, the relevance of the future to the present is, you know, as Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> it really is. And one thing that I, uh, a new effect, which I believe will have a, a lot of excitement in an interdisciplinary way, is, um, something that we're calling the atom of holism. So far, all of science has been reductionistic, rightly so. You know, we know how to look at a piece of a system, forget about everything else that's happening around it, understand everything you can know about the, the piece, and then build something up more complicated. You know, all the causation is from the bottom up. That's, that's how all of science works. Philosophically, people found it very appealing to think about, you know, the whole, having causal powers sure. from top to down. But physics showed that there's all kinds of problems with this. There's, there's deep problems that nobody thought they could solve. So it turns out we've discovered a new effect, again, using this three-step process, in which, in the purest sense, we're able to create that kind of new tar sort of uh, causality, which is holistic, mainly the, the causal powers exist in the whole, but not in any of the parts. I can give you an example if, if you want. Sure. So suppose we have three particles, three boxes. Actually, I can only do it with, with, <laughs> with two. Maybe I'll do it even simpler. Two particles, two boxes. Um, and this, by the way, this experiment has already been done. 
Um, you ask, is there a particle in this box? You just look at that box, nothing there. You ask, is the particle in this box? Nothing there. If you ask both boxes combined without asking the individual boxes, you see that the boxes interact as if there is really a particle here and a particle there. So that's the global thing. That's the whole thing, the two boxes together having an impact on the individual parts. That's completely new. And so what are the implications of that at, at the micro level as it affects the macro level? Well, it, um, it, it depends how it scales, but um, it appears that it could scale very nicely. I mean, for example, as we, you know, if you have a thousand boxes, a thousand particles in a thousand boxes, you look at any one box, nothing there. You look at any two boxes, nothing there. Any three, any four, nothing. Any 999 boxes, still nothing there. But as soon as you look at the global 1,000 boxes together, whammo, you get this huge effect that's all there. How do you do an experiment like that? Ah, um, well, we haven't Because actually... normally particles are in boxes, you look and they're there. <laughs> yeah, this, this is true. So it's a, it's a very important question. Um, it gets back to the nature of the observer in physics. Because for the most part, a lot of these new effects, you can only see them if you look in a gentle way. If you don't use a sledgehammer. And the reason for that is because we're setting a boundary condition in the past and in the future. Um, you have to allow that boundary condition in the future to get through mm -hmm. to the present moment. And if you hit it with a sledgehammer, it tends to shield it, the effects from that, that future boundary condition. So in general, it, you look in a gentle way. So you need causation from the future to make it work? Well, something. <laughs> well, see, that's, the, that's another incredibly loaded question. Right, because right, right. at the same time, you know, in, in, in physics, the notion of causality is you know, primal. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a sacred to us. So it's not quite causation, but it's more like relevance. Something very rich is happening. Mm -hmm. And one of the beautiful things that we discovered is, is that uh, even though the, it would, you would think that if the future is relevant to the present, it would destroy the possibility of free will. The amazing thing is that it doesn't. So what's the actual experiment? It seems so incredible. So in this case, uh, we did the experiment on neutrons, and we needed a lot of neutrons, so we went to the largest nuclear reactor in the world, which is in Grenoble, France. And uh, we, uh, we prepared the neutrons in certain ways. They were coming out of the nuclear reactor. And then we had, that was our, our initial stage, and then we had different kinds of measurements we would do on them. So, uh, you know, they, it, would, it was like there was two boxes, as I was describing. So the prediction was that in this box, you would have the neutron, but no properties. Whereas in this box, you would have no neutrons, but the properties of the neutron, like the Cheshire cat that smiles here and the body's over here. Um, and so, uh, and then later on, we would do something else. That was the third step, right? So it may happen that if the third step wasn't satisfied, we'd have to throw away one of those trials. So all three of these steps had to satisfy. And when they were satisfied, we would like, uh, these neutrons would s smash into a foil or something, and there'd be an effect that we can measure because it's the mass of the neutrons smashing into right. a foil. You measure the magnetic field, we kind of all know how to do that. There's, there's a, you know, there are meters that can measure how much magnetic field is there. And, and sure enough, the meters would show nothing there, and they, they'd be smashing into the, the foil. And over here, nothing was hitting the foil, nothing. No mass of any particle hitting the foil. And we measured the amount of magnetic field there. It was as, as if it was exactly the amount of magnetic field you expect to have for a neutron. Okay, now that, it, 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 those kinds of experiments are basically simple, where neutrons hit foils all the time, right. and you get the normal result of uh, of smashes and, and collisions and magnetic fields. What right. did you do in your experiment that caused this, this, this uh, remarkable result? So you must have done something different. Something different? It's just two things, actually very simple. All we did is that in these experiments in the intermediate time, we just asked the same kind of questions everybody has asked in the past, but as, in a slightly more gentle way, without using a sledgehammer. Okay. And the second thing is we did something later in time. And we appreciated, we connected with what happened later in time with what we were looking at in the earlier time. And when you do just those two simple things, you see all these amazing new properties coming out of the woodwork. Those are the essential aspects of what we, what we and did. And so what, what are the theoretical implications of that? The theoretical implications are, are spectacular. They're, they're, they're huge. It really suggests that 
our basic understanding of time has needs something completely <laughs> new that that uh, you know just the the usual clock way of understanding of time is just the tip of the iceberg in my opinion